All right. Um, it's uh, eight ten now. Uh, let's uh, start the workshop. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the international workshop on BioKDD. Uh, BioKDD stands for Data Mining in Bioinformatics. Uh, believe it or not, this is one of the longest running workshop at the KDD meeting. Uh, we initially started this workshop series in 2001. So this is uh, exactly 21 years later and we're still running and pretty strong. Throughout the years, um, I've seen other workshops and there are topics that's trendy, hot and cold and they go up and down. And I still remember that there were all these uh, kind of a web uh, really technologies and are gradually replaced by hot topics in data mining and AI. And if you look at the topics that's been covered in uh, BioKDD, in fact, the BioKDD is never a uniform uh, single topic over the past 21 years. Uh, I still remember at the very beginning, uh, pretty much a lot of the topic were focused on protein structure analysis and how do you determine the protein structure from sequence, uh, primary sequence, secondary sequence. And then uh, with uh, microarray technology came into being and there's a lot of uh, functional genomics. And with a second, uh, there's a generation sequencers coming in and there's a RNA sequencing. Um, so the, the trend of the bioinformatics is well reflected in the topics that we capture throughout the years. So over the past 20 years, we covered topics including uh, biomedical informatics and bioinformatics. How do you uh, incorporate multimodality omics data in the analysis of uh, biological systems and all the way to human health and intelligent health. And so we're gonna continue this trend and I'm hoping that uh, uh, for those of you who are interested in participating, submit papers, uh, monitor our website. Our website is uh, biokdd.org and the forward slash, uh, I think, uh, uh, BioKDD 2022. And uh, we also are planning to recruit uh, people to help us actually build a better web website. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, come and uh, approach us in the future. We do have um, Facebook uh, pages and LinkedIn pages. We also have a Google uh, mailing list called biokdd-general at googlegroups.com. Um, please uh, come to us uh, if you are confused or if you are interested in becoming subscribed to the information. Um, and I also want to point it out that uh, over the years, we've been uh, pretty good at picking successful people as the keynote speakers. Uh, I'll withhold the information and wait for uh, the, the conference organizer, Yan Da, uh, to introduce our keynote speaker properly. But I'm looking at the past uh, keynote speakers. Um, we do have a record of uh, who presented the keynote speakers. And I think we're pretty successful in picking the early winners. And I'm looking at the list and there's a uh, Steven Salzberg from uh, Johns Hopkins. And we uh, got him before he went to Johns Hopkins. And uh, he's one of the <laughs> first person uh, who come up with so many uh, softwares for uh, second generation sequencing analysis. Of course, uh, Mark Bogoski uh, from uh, uh, Georgia Tech, a uh, two build before he become very successful and uh, become members of the National Acad uh, Academy of Medicine. Of course, uh, here being at the KDD, we have Philip Yu, Wei Wang, and these are all leaders, successful people in uh, data mining. And we even have a person, Eric Shah, who presented here. And for those of you who didn't know, he is one of the 
uh, academic who successfully moved from the industry to academia and from academia back to industry and build a uh, uh, public traded uh, company. So I think uh, today we have uh, uh, Professor Srinivas Alu, and I'm pretty sure that he's already successful. I'm not sure how we can predict that he will be uh, continue to be uh, successful. But nonetheless, I think that the message here is uh, the bio KDD is maybe a little bit small today, but uh, we're going strong throughout the years. And we always try to connect um, computer science with biology and medicine. And we hope that you enjoyed today's session. Uh, and we hope that you will become part of the contributors uh, and organizer in the future as well. Without further ado, I'm going to actually introduce uh, the, uh, the workshop uh, chair, uh, Yan Da, to introduce our program and the keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. And um, today we have uh, one keynote and uh, some presentations. Uh, because of uh, uh, some uh, country has COVID travel restrictions, uh, some presenters cannot come, so they will uh, be presenting by Zoom. And uh, uh, so, without any delay, uh, let me introduce our keynote speaker, Professor uh, Srinivas uh, uh, Alulu. Uh, so, Professor Srinivas Alulu is executive director of the Institute for Data Engineering and Science and a professor in the School of Computational Science and Engineering at the Georgia Tech. He co-leads the NSF South Big Data Regional Innovation Hub as a NSF Transdisciplinary uh, Research Institute for Advancing Data Science. Aluru conducts research in data science, high-performance computing and bioinformatics and system biology. He is a recipient of the NSF Career Award, IBM Faculty Award, uh, Swana J. Yanti Fellowship from the Government of India, the John V. Atanaso Discovery Award from Iowa State University, and the Outstanding Research Program Development Award at Georgia Tech. He is a fellow of the AAAS, ACM, IEEE, and SIAM, and a recipient of the IEEE Computer Society Golden Core and uh, Material uh, Meritorial Service Awards. So, uh, without any further delay, let's welcome uh, Dr. Aluru for uh, his keynote talk. Uh, the title is Machine Learning Approaches for Reverse Engineering Genome Scale Networks. Thank you, thank you, Jan, for the generous introduction. I want to thank the organizers, uh, Jan, Dan, Jake Chen, for inviting me to give the keynote at the workshop uh, this year. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I do realize I'm following a, a distinguished uh, line of speakers and uh, who you caught early. So uh, I'm hoping some good things will happen to me also uh, in the in in the coming years. Uh, uh, I was actually supposed to give the keynote uh, four years ago when the meeting was in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I couldn't make it due to family emergency and found a substitute uh, a speaker, a, a former student of mine at that time. So uh, thank you for giving me a second chance uh, to, to come here and, 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 and present to you. Um, so I also understand that there are several participants who are remote, so hopefully they are able to uh, hear and follow along well. Um, I have a remote where I hope uh, the pointer will be visible to the remote uh, participants uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, I looked at the keynotes of the past and so forth, and like everyone else, I work in a few different areas. Uh, and I wanted to pick something that is more relevant to the theme of uh, uh, BioKDD, uh, and also something that may be slightly different uh, from the talks that uh, uh, 
uh, were given uh, earlier. So uh, my talk is going to be on uh, reverse engineering genome scale networks, and I'll explain what, uh, what I mean by genome scale networks uh, fairly uh, soon. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about actually applying uh, the algorithms that I'll be talking about today uh, in the area of plant biology, because you often hear about uh, uh, human health and those areas. Uh, so I wanted to show you something different uh, different uh, this, this, this time around. Um, so the uh, gene networks uh, broadly, uh, whether uh, they are genome scale or a smaller scale, is a very actively studied topic. Uh, I think there's research on it dating back at least uh, 30 plus years. Uh, so, uh, what I'll be focusing on today is essentially how do we build uh, networks by scavenging all the big data from experiments available around the world from public databases, no matter who did the experiment and for what reason, which country and so forth. So there's, uh, in, in biology, as you know, there is an agreement that data gets deposited in public repositories. Uh, and so what my group has worked on is that rather than keep doing new experiments and, and which, which are very expensive, is there something that we can learn by data mining, the data that's already out there, uh, and then generate intelligent biological hypothesis that would reduce further experimental costs. That's really the, uh, the motivation of that work. And uh, for that, we really need to, uh, you know, analyze all of the data that is publicly available uh, and, and, and build networks without knowing which genes are important. So we must consider all of the genes and so forth. So the networks get extremely large. Um, so then how do you construct these things? And the networks will never be, you know, accurate or perfect. So how do you make use of such imperfect uh, networks to advance biology? So uh, this is really the niche corner of the gene networks area that I'll be talking about, where uh, my group, uh, along with several collaborators, has been working for the last 15 years or so. Um, and because it's a keynote, I'll not go into uh, you know, mathematical details of any one particular method, but I want to give you an overall sense of uh, you know, different sub-projects that we've done under this and how they all fit together uh, and uh, in, in the end, I'll show you some real biology that we are able to do with this and so forth. Uh, and anyone is interested in the <clears throat> deeper mathematical aspects of any single result, uh, you know, is encouraged to reach out to me. There's also, um, you know, I can make a PDF copy of the slides available if you like, and then there are uh, indexes to papers and so forth. And the talk will be heavily focused on work in my group, but I do want to acknowledge that there is actually tons of work in this area. <clears throat> so keep that, keep that in mind, uh, but I'll be just focusing more on, on my own contributions. So uh, at the outset, uh, I want to mention that uh, the uh, work that I'll be presenting today um, actually is more of an application-driven work in the sense that we have some grand challenge problems that we want to work on. Um, and to solve them, it requires expertise from uh, many areas, right? So in this case, it would be uh, you know, biology, bioinformatics and computational biology, plant biology, uh, statistics, machine learning, uh, data mining, high performance computing, and so forth. Uh, and obviously, I don't have expertise in all of these uh, fields, uh, you know, hopefully is some degree of understanding in a subset of these fields. So this work would not be possible uh, without, uh, you know, several of my PhD students and postdocs and research scientists who you see on the left column here, uh, and also a number of collaborators across multiple universities who have uh, expertise in, in these areas uh, that either supplement or, or complement the expertise that I have so that we could, we could work on these issues. So let me motivate this uh, work uh, by giving you an example uh, back around uh, you know, uh, 2010. So we kind of initiated this work around 2007 or so, uh, but the best way to introduce this work is to kind of show you this uh, motivating example. <clears throat> so what you're seeing uh, here uh, is a plant called Arabidopsis thaliana, okay? Uh, it is not a useful plant to humans in the sense that uh, it is not an economically important crop. Uh, nobody eats it, not even animals. So this is just a, just a weed basically. Um, but the reason why this plant is very important to biologists is that it is the simplest plant organism out there that has enough complexity that you could study it instead of studying the more economically important crops like rice or wheat or sorghum uh, and maize and so forth. Um, and it has a relatively small genome. It's only 125 million base pairs as opposed to maize has 
2.5 billion base pairs, almost the size of the human genome, in fact, even more complex than human genome and so forth. So Arabidopsis is a widely you know, uh, uh, studied model organism. It is the first plant genome to be sequenced. Uh, you know, just like we sequence human genome, there is an effort to sequence plant genomes, and this is the first one uh, sequenced in 2000. And this organism has about 22 and a half thousand genes, which collectively produce about 35,000 uh, proteins. Uh, so, you know, each gene can sometimes code for multiple proteins through alternative splicing and so forth. Uh, so, um, the reason why studying this uh, organism is important is because you will find the same genes and same pathways and even economically important crops, and this is a simpler model to study. So right after the genome was sequenced, the National Science Foundation launched an ambitious program, uh, a decade-long program called Arabidopsis 2010. So they launched this in 2001, and the idea is that uh, over the next 10 years, they're going to fund lots of researchers so that at the end of the program, we would know everything about every gene in this organism. Just catalog the whole thing, understand the whole organism, and file it away. So that was the goal. Uh, and I actually had a, a student go and count the total of all of these awards made. So NSF spent $265 million in the Arabidopsis 2010 program over the 10 years. Uh, and uh, there are other countries which pitched in as well. So for example, uh, the German Research Foundation started an Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis Functional Genome Network Program, AFGN, and they've kicked in additional money and so forth. So collectively, at least half a billion dollars of money was spent. Uh, to try to understand the genes of this, this organism. So by the end of this program in 2010, the status is that a third of the genes uh, still uh, don't have any known function. Uh, also, just because you know a function of a gene doesn't mean that you know all the functions of the gene because a gene can have multiple roles and so forth. So as you can see, this is actually uh, a model organism, not an economically important crop. Half a billion dollars is spent, which is a lot of money. Uh, and we still don't have a full understanding. So the question is that, uh, can machine learning uh, help in some way? Can data mining and machine learning help in some way? So uh, how do uh, biologists uh, uh, study uh, the function of a gene, right? How would you, how would you know, right? So we, we have a catalog of 22,500 genes. In fact, even the genes, we won't have exact knowledge. You, know, you could run through a genomic sequence and try to predict where the genes are, what the genes are. Uh, but unless the genes express themselves, you don't have a direct evidence, right? So the way to understand the function of a gene is to catch them in action, right? So there are experiments that will give you the expression level of every gene in the organism at a given instance of time. You, know, you can take a snapshot. Right. So earlier this was done using microarray experiments. Uh, now it is uh, done using RNA-seq experiments. Different experimental protocols to save time. I won't go into it, but the idea is that at the end of the experiment, you get the expression level of every gene in that organism. Right. Now the way genes work, uh, probably all of you know this already, but just in case. Uh, so essentially, the genes get copied onto a molecule called mRNA. And then the mRNA, after some post-translational modifications, get turned into protein molecules. So if a, a protein is important, so proteins are the ones that are responsible for all kinds of functions. So if a biological process is going on, right, uh, and a protein is required for it, the gene responsible for producing it will actually kick into action. Maybe there are other genes which are called transcription factors that trigger this. And then the multiple copies of the mRNA are made from the gene, and then the mRNA gets converted to a protein. So to catch a gene in action would be uh, to essentially measure the mRNAs that are coming out of every gene. And uh, that is what is called gene expression data. So the gene is being expressed into mRNA, and you want to capture the, uh, the mRNA, right? And, and, and see really how much of it is there. So it's a quantitative thing. Right. So earlier we would do microarray experiments, which essentially have probes corresponding to every mRNA, and there is essentially uh, some kind of a lighting up mechanism, uh, and the intensity would be greater if there are more copies and so forth. So you look at the intensity and translate that to a number, and you get gene expression data. More modern thing uh, technology is the RNA seq, where you collectively take this mRNA, digest it, run it through a sequencer, and you get these fragments, and from the fragments estimate the number of copies of mRNA that you've seen. In either case, what you're getting is an estimate of the gene expression data. 
uh, which is itself going to be nice and imperfect. It also depends on how the experiment was done. Let's say you and I do the experiment and you do hybridization for five minutes and I do hybridization for seven minutes, then you know my spots will be more intense because I've just simply soaked it in the solution two minutes longer than you and so forth. So unless you do some kind of a statistical pre-processing and normalization, that data doesn't even make sense. And that must be done even if the experiments are done within a lab. So if you're analyzing data from across the labs, different parts of the world and so forth, there is no uniformity. So there is going to be a statistical nightmare. I'm not going to go into details of how that is done, but that needs to be done to even create these gene expression uh, data sets. So the main idea is that if you want to know the roles of certain genes, you could observe a biological process in its presence and absence, right? So if you take a plant, for example, you might, uh, you might give it normal water versus salt water. So salt water is a stress to the plant and how does it deal with it, right? So you grind up some tissue and then you do a gene expression measurement and say, okay, you know, normal water, what is the gene expression of all the genes? And, uh, uh, you know, salt water, what is the gene expression for all the genes? So this is called the differential gene expression analysis where you see what genes are expressed differently. Then it gives you a pretty good hunch that, hey, this gene must be involved in this pathway, right? Uh, you can do this for humans also for different tissues, right? If I want to understand the genes that play a role in uh, functioning of the brain, I need to take the gene expression measurement of brain tissue versus some other tissue. And if some genes are differentially expressed in the brain, then they must be have something to do with the functioning of the brain. So you could do brain, liver, kidney, and so forth, and you will see that the same set of genes are there in every cell, but then different cell genes are expressed and so forth. So this is what biologists do. So they do experiments, they target a few genes, and then they target a pathway, and then they do the differential gene expression analysis. They build a network for some 50 or so focused genes and so forth. So what we thought was that at that time, we found that there are 1100 760 gene expression data sets available in public repository. So each data set would be the expression level of every gene uh, in that organism. So if it's Arabidopsis, think of it like a matrix of 22,500 rows, one for each gene, and 11,760 columns, one for each of these uh, 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 data sets. Uh, of course, now the number is more like 25, 30,000 and so forth. So that keeps growing over time. So what we thought was that why don't we just take all the gene expression measurements we can find anywhere, regardless of the condition and so forth, uh, and then uh, come up with uh, network construction methods that uh, try to generate what we call a genome wide or whole genome network uh, of all of these things. And maybe that network, even though it's not going to be perfect, and there is actually a valid reason why it will never be perfect, because the network is not a static thing, right? In every biological process, you have a separate network. So if you take all of these experiments, you kind of get some broad brush strokes about what this looks like, uh, but it's not going to be uh, accurate for any particular thing. So you build some kind of a uh, rough idea networks, basically, right? So you have some kind of a bird level view, uh, but can you do this? Can you look at these networks and somehow predict what genes might play what role and then do targeted gene expression experiments so that you don't go blind and then waste a lot of money. So the idea is, could you save on experimental costs by doing all of these things? So that's what we, we started off with when we started this work back in uh, 2007 or so. Okay, uh, so by the time we started this work, there are obviously active research going on in gene networks um, and you have uh, you know many structured learning methods. So pretty much any a uh, method that one can think of to infer a network uh, from data has been applied, right? Uh, so the simplest is uh, so, something called Pearson correlation coefficient, which you're all familiar with. Essentially, it can uh, see if there is any linear cor correlation between a pair, a, pair, a pair of variables if you give the measurements. So you can think of the variables as the genes and uh, the uh, gene expression, the value of that gene, how much it is expressed in every condition and every experiment as a vector essentially, right? So you have a vector of observations for every gene. Uh, and then you could compute the Pearson correlation coefficient between the two vectors. And then you would come up with uh, what you call a correlation network, okay? Uh, now, what happens is that obviously, you know, in this community knows that correlation is not causation. And biologists would be really interested in not these co-expression networks, which are correlation networks, but they're interested in what they call gene regulatory networks, uh, where essentially, uh, genes which are called transcription factors will trigger the expression of other genes and sometimes they trigger the 
uh, activity of the other transcription factors and so forth. So this would be a directed graph uh, with uh, transcription factors triggering other transcription factors and the rest of the genes, uh, you know, directly or indirectly and so forth. And that's what they would like to see. With the co-expression networks, it's a, it's a more dense network. And so essentially, if there's an indirect, if there's a causation, uh, if there's an indirect causation why two things are related, you would still see an edge between them and so forth. And Pearson correlation is the simplest of them, which only can uh, look at the linear correlations and so forth, but it's very simple to compute. Um, so other techniques include uh, Gaussian graphical models, information theory-based approaches, Bayesian networks, uh, and later machine learning approaches were also uh, developed. So this is a snapshot at around uh, 2010 or so. Right. So one of the things that we observed is that, uh, as you would expect, uh, the you know the the methods that uh, give you higher accuracy and higher applicability are also compute intensive, uh, and therefore they would be slow essentially. Right. I mean it's a fair thing to expect, and that's the case here. And there is a, a well-known paper in the Proceedings National Academy of Science in 2010 by Marbach uh, and others, where they made uh, two observations. One of them they found was that most of these network inference, uh, uh, network uh, uh, structure learning methods do very poorly on an absolute basis. In fact, if you randomly connect genes, you know, put genes on the board and randomly put edges between them, uh, and that was giving better answers than a third of these methods, which are supposed to be for the network, right? So that's pretty bad. Uh, and what is worse is that they observed this behavior even on a small scale, right? You know, you're building 50 gene networks and that's it. 50 genes, you know, 20 genes, 100 genes, and they were finding that many methods were failing already. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to build a genome scale network, then you need to really have 20,000 genes and so forth. So these methods would fail. Uh, and uh, things like Pearson correlation coefficient, which are very easy to scale, right? You could compute Pearson coefficient for 20,000 genes and gene pairs and all that stuff, uh, but they would have lower quality essentially. So people are either saying, okay, I'm either going to artificially restrict my analysis to a subset of the genes, or otherwise I'll use a large number of genes, but use a, a method that is not so good. I have to cut, uh, uh, you know, I have to make compromises somewhere because I can't solve the problem. So what we decided to do at that time was, okay, so let's try to take some of the best of these methods, which are compute intensive, like information theory and like Bayesian networks, and let us scale them. So first, let us see if we can improve on the algorithms, the sequential algorithms, right? So can we compute mutual information fast? Can we compute Bayesian networks fast? You know, what can we do? So improve the algorithm to make it as fast as you can, and then turn to parallel computing and if necessary, supercomputers, uh, and invent parallel algorithms to make them work at a much larger scale so that we could actually scavenge all the data in public repositories statistically pre-process it, com compute these networks, and then use the networks in, uh, uh, in, in biological studies. So that's the, that's the overall uh, goal plan here. So uh, the rest of the talk is going to be the following. I'm going to show you, uh, you know, uh, four different methods for constructing these networks. Um, I'll go over them at a uh, reasonable uh, high level of detail so that you get the overall picture. Uh, but for details, you'll need to read the respective papers. And after that, uh, before my time runs out, uh, I want to show you actually some actual experiment uh, uh, that we've done in the plant biology area uh, and how we can put this knowledge to use, uh, the, the network construction to use for knowledge discovery in, 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 in the domain. Okay, so the first uh, method of construction that I'm going to be talking about is an information theoretic approach. So this approach works as follows. Um, you essentially compute uh, the mutual information between the expression vectors of every pair of genes, right? Uh, so mutual information uh, is symmetric. So uh, I of uh, Xi, Xj, and Xj, Xi are identical. It's related to the individual entropy and joint entropy. If you like, you can think of the uh, expression vector for each gene. So here Xi is a gene, Xj is a gene, you have N, uh, and genes, and you have M experiments. So you can think of each uh, gene as a vector of M observations, basically. And you can treat them as uh, observed values of a random variable, uh, you know, if you like. Um, and you, you, you compute the mutual information using individual entropies and joint entropies using this uh, standard equation. Um, and essentially, this gives you a co-expression type network. The difference between this and Pearson correlation is that Pearson correlation gives you linear relationships 
mutual information is able to discover non-linear relationships. So it, it, it can discover those as well, in addition to the linear ones. So it does a better job. Now we want to turn that into a regulatory network, sort of. So basically what we want to do is that in this example, uh, let's say you have a triangle. And so you're essentially trying to learn a, a network, which is a graph. So you can think of it as a graph, if you like. You can think of it like the adjacency matrix of a graph, if you like. So by computing the mutual information between every pair of gene vectors, you're essentially computing an N by N matrix. And this is going to be the adjacency matrix of a graph. And then you can have a cutoff for the mutual information. If it is above a certain threshold, then you uh, you know, include that edge, otherwise you don't. So you have you know, some kind of a sparse graph. And then you could look for triangles in the graph, essentially, to remove indirect interactions. So the idea is very simple that you have, let's say you have three uh, genes, uh, xi, xj, uh, and xk, and you observe co-expression between every one of these pairs. Uh, but uh, let's say the mutual information is weaker from xi to xk, uh, but the mutual information is stronger if you go from xi to xj and xj to xk. Then you essentially postulate that maybe this xi to xk is just a, a correlation that you're observing, but the actual uh, triggering uh, is that the path is from xi to xk via xj basically, right? So maybe xi triggers xj and xj triggers xk, or maybe the other way around. Uh, and this mutual information based method cannot uh, detect uh, uh, directed interactions. So some of these networks are undirected, even though the actual biological gene regulatory network would be a directed one. If you don't know the interactions, then it's going to be undirected. So that's what it does. So essentially it processes these uh, triangles and then it's called data processing inequality. It tries to predict indirect interactions and remove them. And, and it hopes that it recovers the gene regulatory network. So this is uh, work by uh, Basso et al. in 2005 uh, that was packaged into a software called Arachne. Um, and this was already there when we were uh, when we started our work. Uh, the main issue was that this would not really scale to a large number of genes and the large number of experiments that we were targeting and so forth. So uh, what we wanted to do, as I mentioned, is that we want to improve the algorithm and then try to go parallel to solve bigger problems. So one of the things is that uh, uh, some people use a static threshold for the mutual information, but that turns out to be a bad idea because the strength of the interaction uh, is, is, is not uh, alone sufficient because if it is, uh, you have to assess it with respect to the neighbors, you have to assess it with respect to other things. So there may be weak signals and so forth. So you cannot really count on the strength of the signal alone. So the way to do this would be that uh, there's permutation testing where what you do is if you're trying to compute the mutual information between a, a, a pair of genes xi and xj you take you fix xi the expression vector of xi and you take the expression vector of xj and you uh, randomly permute it okay so we are uh, permuting xj here pi of xj pi refers to permutation of this vector we keep xi fixed and we again compute the mutual information. So essentially we jumbled up the other vector um, and then we try to compute the mutual information and so forth. So the idea of permutation testing is that you, you consider the mutual information between xi and xj as significant uh, only if it beats the uh, every permutation test essentially, right? So when you jumble up the vector, the, res the resulting mutual information should be very low. Uh, and if that's the case, then you say, okay, the mutual information that I originally observed is significant. And of course, there are M factorial permutations of a vector of size M, uh, and you can't do all M factorial. For example, in our case, M may be 20,000 experiments, so you can't do 20,000 factorial tests. So in practice, you just use a large sample. So uh, what we did was that there is a, a well-known property that mutual information is invariant under homeomorphism. So the picture I'm showing you is a, is a homeomorphic uh, function. A homeomorphic function is a function between uh, two topologies, right? In this case, I'm showing you a donut and a coffee cup, and you can see that one can be transformed into the other continuously. So what that means is that there is a, a function that you can map from a point in the donut to a point in the, in the, in the, in the, in the coffee cup. Uh, you know, it's a homeomorphic function if it is a continuous function and also has an inverse basically, right? Um, so uh, there is a well-known uh, result that if you have a homeomorphic function f and if you apply that to xi and xj and then compute the mutual information, it's the same as the original mutual information. So you can do homeomorphic transformations if that makes life easy and then compute the mutual information. 
And there is a result by Krasko et al. in 2004 that says that if you take each gene expression vector and replace every component with the rank of that number within that vector, it is a very good approximation to homeomorphism. So you could use that uh, and then estimate the mutual information very closely. And you can you have to use B-spline functions and so forth uh, to estimate this mutual information and, and, and all of that stuff. So uh, what you can do is that you can use that mutual information can be now computed on the rank transform data. So now every gene expression vector becomes a permutation of the numbers one through M because we're just simply looking at the gene expression vector and say the smallest number is going to be one, the next smallest is two and so forth. So we're just going to replace the gene expression values with these integers from one to n, okay? Uh, so this work is published in IEEE Transactions on Parallel Distributed Systems in 2010. And uh, so a couple of things you can observe here is that now each gene expression vector is a permutation of the numbers one through m. And because a random permutation of one uh, uh, profile is a random permutation of another, because every one of them is a permutation of one through M, you can actually aggregate the permutation testing. So if you want to use a certain number of permutation tests, a permutation test that is done for one pair is valid for the other pair, right? So if you choose Q, if you choose Q permutations per pair, uh, then the total number of permutation tests would be Q times N choose two, where N is the number of genes. So the sample size for permutations could be reduced by a factor of N choose two, so which is roughly half N square. Um, so that really makes your sequential algorithm very fast. In addition, the mutual information can be more easily computed because in the equation, the individual entropies become the same. Um, and therefore, you can just compute them. And therefore, instead of computing mutual information, you just estimate the joint entropy and so forth. So these things will give you a great amount of algorithmic uh, saving in runtime. So the, the code really becomes maybe two orders of magnitude faster already on a sequential basis. Then we try to uh, figure out how to compute this in parallel. Um, so the parallel algorithm here is a pretty standard trick in parallel computing. It's not that difficult. Uh, and for this, you don't need even shared memory. You could do it very easily on a distributed memory parallel computer. So what we are, what the example here I'm showing is that we are trying to compute the adjacency matrix of a network that you're trying to infer, right? So this is an N by N adjacency matrix and you have to compute it. So to compute it, basically you have to compute mutual information for every pair of genes. You have to do permutation testing for every pair of genes. You have to do all of that stuff, right? So here is an example where you have six processors, uh, P0, P1, P2, et cetera. So these are the uh, processor uh, numbers. Okay, so we have six processors uh, with the IDs or ranks zero through five. So what you do is that you break your N by N matrix into P by P sub matrices where P is the number of processors. So you see a six by six decomposition. It's also a symmetric matrix. So you only have to compute half of it. And uh, the uh, numbers that you see, 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, uh, are showing which sub-blocks of this matrix are computed in iteration 0, iteration 1, iteration 2, et cetera. Um, and so there's a neat formula for this, that the processor with rank J computes uh, uh, you know, the uh, sub-block of the sub-matrix uh, given by J comma J plus I mod P. Uh, and the main advantage of this kind of a decomposition is that the data flow is very simple. Uh, so to compute a block like this, right? If I want to compute a submatrix, I need all the gene vectors of the rows and all the gene vectors of the columns, right? So the rows are genes, columns are genes, and then I need the gene expression vectors. So if you see, uh, each processor is given a set of rows. So you have the same gene expression vectors that everybody needs. It is disjoint, so you can easily do distributed memory parallel. On the vertical axis, essentially, uh, you know, if you know if these columns of genes are required by, let's say, processor three in step zero, in the next step, uh, processor two needs it. In the next step, processor one needs it, and so forth. So, if you just left shift, if you imagine these processors as if they are connected in a ring, and if you keep doing this left shift of the data, uh, then the data will move beautifully through it, and then you can compute all of these things. So, uh, we program this. And then with this uh, algorithm, the parallel algorithm, we developed a software called TINCH, uh, which stands for Tool for Inferring Networks of Genes. Uh, and so how fast can you infer uh, genome scale networks on this? So we are trying to build a uh, Arabidopsis Thaliana networks at that time from these 11,760 gene expression experiments. Uh, so in 2007, uh, on the IBM Blue Gene L, which is a limited memory per node distributed memory machine, uh, on a 1024 node blue gene L, 
we could uh, build this whole genome network in, in about 45 minutes. Okay, so at that time, the networks were never built on something such a large scale. This is two orders of magnitude larger than what other people were studying with 100 genes and so forth. Um, and uh, with advances in high performance computing, the runtime you know, became even less and less of an issue. Uh, so two years later, you know, we could do this on a 1024 core standard uh, cluster, InfiniBand cluster in just nine minutes. Um, and then a few years later, Intel took our software and put this on the Xeon uh, Phi accelerator chip. And in a single accelerator chip using that, they could really build the whole genome network in 22 minutes. So you can build these networks really, really fast. Now, one problem with the uh, mutual information networks like this is that they are really looking at pairs of variables. Uh, and obviously in the real biological setting, there could be a number of transcription factors that are affecting a gene and so forth, right? Um, so uh, you could uh, you could mitigate that by using conditional mutual information and so forth, but the way to really model combinatorial uh, regulation more naturally um, is by using Bayesian networks. So we next uh, turned our attention to modeling gene networks as Bayesian networks. One advantage is that these networks are also directed networks. So maybe we could get combinatorial regulation and the directionality and a few other good things here. Right, uh, but I should warn you that uh, Bayesian networks is no panacea, right? So this community knows well how Bayesian networks work. Uh, they're essentially a factoring of the joint probability distribution. There may be multiple ways of factoring joint probability distribution. And uh, obviously uh, they would all be equally good answers from the data. Um, so, you know, maybe one of them is the actual gene regulatory network, but there is no guarantee that uh, uh, the one that you pick would be the, the correct one. Uh, but one good thing about Bayesian networks is that uh, all of these equivalent networks are good for inference. So when you wanted to inference, then you will get reasonable uh, results from them. Uh, so we actually worked on several different types of Bayesian network structure learning. I'm only going to show you score-based here, but we also did work on constraint-based uh, Bayesian network learning and so forth. Again, our goal is that there is already software available, not even in the computational biology area, but even more generally, like Banjo and BN Learn and so forth, where you could just learn these net networks. Uh, but certainly at that time, and maybe even true now, is that the scale of these networks is somewhat limited unless they go really, really uh, approximate or heuristic and so forth to tame the computational complexity. So we want to build these uh, networks on 15,000, 20,000 nodes, Bayesian networks. So that's, that's our big problem. So again, we turn to supercomputers and even bigger ones this time. And I'll just give you a, a, an idea of how this uh, solution works. Um, so uh, what you're seeing here is a, a Bayesian network. And the way we construct the optimal Bayesian network is that we have this notion of a scoring uh, function, right? The scoring function takes two variables as input. So one of them is a, is a node in the network or a random variable, that, which is basically a gene. So you treat each gene as a random variable and then the gene expression vector is a vector of observations of that random variable. And so the function tells you that if I choose a subset of the genes uh, or the nodes to be the parents of uh, node X, what is the score of that? So it's a fitness function that tells you, if you choose the parents of a node, how good are these parents, right? Meaning that how good are the gene expression vectors of these uh, variables? In If I give you that, how well can you predict the gene expression of Xi, right? So uh, basically, given a, a network, it's a decomposable scoring function. So you can essentially separate it into individual nodes and look at its parents, right? So B has A and E as parents, and E has C as a parent, and so forth, right? So you can separate out uh, for every node, what are the parents, and you can apply the scoring function, S of Xi comma parents of Xi, and you can sum it over all of them. It's an additive decomposable scoring function, and that's how you score a network. And the optimal network or an anoptimal network is the one that optimizes the score. So explore all possible space of networks, which is super exponential. And then from that, you can uh, get the optimal. So this is an NP-hard problem, right? It's a proven NP-hard problem. So um, the way with this, the nice thing about this decomposable scoring function, in fact, there are books written on how to even choose the scoring function. In fact, there is a book called Minimum Description Length Principle, MDL, which tells you how to design scoring functions according to just one method, right? So this is a fairly involved study of statistics and other areas. So here we assume that such a scoring function exists. Uh, and if it exists, right, what you need to do is that 
you all you have to do is figure out the parents of every node or every gene. And then once you have that information, put them together in a network, all right? So if you can explore every possible subset of all the other genes, which would be exponential, and run this function S and see what gives you the best score, then you are finding the parents of that node, right? But obviously you cannot do this because the power set is exponential. So here is the uh, method that we came up with. So you want to reduce the number of candidates that you want to consider to be a parent of a particular gene. So I use CP for a candidate parent set and OP for the optimal parent set. So we first use the mutual information algorithm to find correlations and so forth and weed out many of the other genes and come up with a small candidate parent set for every gene, right? So that is CP. Um, and that's going to be symmetric. So I don't know the directionality. So if I see a, 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 a correlation between two genes, either one could be the parent of the other. So we put each of them in the candidate parent set of the other one, right? So this is how we create candidate parent set for every gene and these set sizes vary. And we hope that it's much smaller than the total number of genes. So once we do that, we will take each candidate parent set and generate every possible subset, apply the scoring function and figure out the best set of parents and call that the optimal set of parents. So this will take exponential time, two to the power, the runtime of, sorry, two to the power, the size of the uh, candidate parent, parent set, right? So what we do is that we say, hey, if the candidate parent set size is less than or equal to a threshold T, only then I want to do it. So gather all the genes with candidate parent set sizes less than the threshold and then do that exponential work for all of them to find out the optimal parents. Then we look at the, uh, the genes with much larger candidate parent sets. And one good thing that, that comes out of it is that if somebody else claims you as a parent, then you know that uh, you are their parent and therefore you don't need to consider them to be your parent. They're your child, it's established. So you can remove it from the candidate parent set. So you can do that to reduce their sizes and many of them will become smaller size by this time. This actually has a biological basis because there are transcription factors that trigger a large number of other transcription factors and genes. So the out degree can be large, but the in degree is small. So if the out degree is large, all of those genes which have a smaller in degree will claim it as a parent. And now you remove that, all of these genes from their candidate parent set, and then the candidate parent set becomes small. So we found that this works actually very well in practice. And if you're still left with a handful of genes which have a much larger candidate parent sets, then you give up and say, look, I can't compute and I'm going to just pick the top T correlations or something like that. So now you exponentially mine these things and then you put them together. And because you put them together independently for every gene, the resulting graph might have cycles. Uh, biologists tell me that you can stop there and we like that network, but a true Bayesian network is a directed acyclic graph and therefore you may have to remove the cycles if you really want it to be Bayesian network. But my biology collaborators tell me that, you know, run the Bayesian network algorithm, but stop before the last step and I like that network better, even though because in real biology you can have cycles. So I don't know what that structure is mathematically, it doesn't make sense to me, but they seem to like it. Okay, so how do you compute uh, the uh, optimal parent set from a candidate parent set? So this will be like exploring a subset lattice, right? So you have a candidate parent set, the largest of which is here at the bottom, and you want to consider every subset of this and so forth. So there's a subset lattice, and it turns out that if you don't compute everything directly, but compute it from a subset that has one element less, then you can compute it faster. So we basically compute this in a depth first such manner. Uh, so that you uh, minimize the memory usage and so forth. And if the, what we do is to do this in parallel, we set the maximum unit of work to be an R dimensional hypercube and we allow up to T dimensional hypercubes. Uh, so subset lattice is a binary hypercube in structure. So the work unit is R dimensional and then the maximum work we take is T dimensional. So if T is greater than R, which is the, would be the case, then you break it into sub hypercubes like I'm showing, and then you can allocate this to different processors and compute. Okay, um, so uh, I will just show you some, some results. And because this is an NP hard problem and we are actually doing an exponential search, we really needed a big super. Uh, in around 2013, 2014, when we did this work, the Tianhe 2 supercomputer uh, at, at Changsha uh, was the top supercomputer in the world. So we were able to get access to it through a collaboration with them. 
uh, and Intel, which actually built that supercomputer. So we worked as a team and then we parallelized this across a large supercomputer. So if you look at the Kian head one, we also ran this on the Stampede at uh, Texas Austin, but that's a, a smaller supercomputer, uh, still you know among the top 10, but not number one. So let me just focus on Kian head two. So this has a large number of nodes, and then every node has uh, two CPUs uh, with uh, multiple cores as usual, but it also has three co-processors. Each of them is a Xeon Phi. So if you collectively look at it, there are 192 cores, two 12 core processors, and three 56 core Xeon fees. Uh, so you have to write a parallel program that runs in a distributed way across the nodes. And then within the node, uh, it will work on CPUs and the Xeon fee accelerator. And the accelerator code will be different. And then uh, with Xeon fee, luckily it's not that different from the CPU code. You have to make use of every core in the CPU, every core in Xeon fee. You have to match the speeds by giving the work according to the ability of these uh, things and so forth. So it's a massive undertaking. Uh, and I can show you that using this, when I say 8,192 nodes, each node collectively has 192 cores spread between the CPU and the accelerator. If you multiply the two, it's actually one and a half million cores. So we were using one and a half million cores here to compute Bayesian networks, and the runtime is in the close to a couple of minutes. So this represents five orders of magnitude larger computation than uh, previously done. Uh, and it was the best uh, applications paper in the supercomputing conference in 2014. Uh, and it's one of the best paper finalists. So we were able to build these large scale networks. Uh, now I want to go over a couple of other things uh, more quickly because I do want to get to the uh, biology results in the end. Uh, more recently, we started looking at uh, uh, machine learning uh, based uh, based uh, based approaches of a different variety uh, by using neural networks and, and 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 so forth. The reason for doing this is in the context of single cell biology or single cell gene regulatory networks. So this is a fascinating emerging area, uh, only about maybe a decade old or so, uh, and a lot of attention is being paid in this area, where in single cell biology basically you are able to measure the expression levels of all the genes at the level of a single cell, as opposed to a bulk gene expression studies that we used to do before, where you take a tissue which consists of a bunch of cells and you grind them and then you do a collective gene expression study. Now, the reason for doing this is that every, every cell is different from the next cell. And if you want to study diseases like cancer and so forth, right, you want to study them at a greater resolution. If you just grind up the whole tissue and you get the average measurement, it's not good enough, right? But the problem, single cell data is that the gene expression measurements are very small, right? So if you are doing human single cell experiments, maybe you want to do measure 30,000 genes and uh, maybe you will expression of only 15% of the genes or so. So it's really hard. You have lots of missing data um, and then you don't know really what the neighboring cells are. So there is something called spatial transcriptomics. You have to do some other computation to try to estimate what the neighboring cells are. So when needed, you have to use their gene expression values as an approximation for yours and so forth. So with this level of noise and so forth, uh, the deep learning techniques tend to do better and the mutual information and Bayesian network-based methods don't do, don't do that well. So we looked into designing algorithms in this area and other people are already doing. And a simple way to think about this is the following. You have a set of genes known as the transcription factors, that is XT here, that's the set. Uh, and then the XG is the set of all genes. Uh, sorry, X is the set of all genes. And then XT is the set of transcription factors. And you're modeling the expression of each gene. So XG refers to a specific gene as a function of the transcription, transcription factor values plus random noise epsilon, right? So this is how you kind of model it. And then you want to learn this equation. The, 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 so the function can be anything. And the function will have parameters as usual. And so you want to learn these functions from data. And epsilon is some kind of a random noise. And this is a set of equations. So there's an equation for every g, right? So that's kind of how it is modeled. And there are a bunch of techniques that people have come up with. Uh, so again, you could uh, take that function to be linear. Tigress does that. Uh, and the Gini 3 models FG as a random forest. GRN boost does uh, gradient boosting over Gini 3 and so forth, right? So all of these are um, unsupervised uh, uh, learning methods. So what we have done is that we tried to uh, inject supervised learning uh, into this field, right? And supervised learning does well if you have 
uh, correct supervised learning example. So one of the key insights that we demonstrated and proved is that you can't get data here to train basically, right? Because you don't know what you're trying to learn. So therefore there is no truth data. But the community built simulators, right? So the simulators essentially what they do is that they first construct a network uh, and then the network is uh, simulating the actual biological network. So using similar sparsity, density, uh, hubs and other characteristics. So you create a synthetic network. And then you say, if this is the network, what would the biological data be? And they actually accurately model the kind of measurement errors and noise and other things that we would see and so forth. So these simulators do a very good job of creating synthetic data networks and corresponding data sets and so forth. So what we showed was that the synthetic networks and these simulators were good enough that we could use it for training, for supervised training. And if we do that, then we get uh, better quality answers than unsupervised learning. So that's really the, uh, the, the, that's really the gist of it in a, in, in a summary. Okay. So I'm going to speed this up a little bit more because I have, you know, two, two other methods and I want to get to uh, some of the results. Uh, but mainly what we did here was that we built a framework called granular. And essentially for uh, in the framework, you could do various neural networks and different things like that. Um, so for choice of these functions to model the expression of every gene, we use neural networks. And then, as I mentioned, we do supervised learning by taking simulator data from a simulator called Sergio, which is pretty good. Um, and then we capture the sparsity of the network by using a new technique in deep learning called unrolled algorithm, where you make copies of the neural network a certain number of times. And one of the ideas, uh, one of the advantages of that is that then the feedback loops will go away because they become directed at just from one iteration to another iteration. And so you could use traditional algorithms like alternative minimization, back propagation, and so forth. So, so we do that. So this fairly recent result published this year in Journal of Computational Biology. Um, so uh, here is a one layer neural network, but you know, you could do multiple layers. Uh, and what we do is that you have transcription factors here at the top, you have the genes at the bottom, and then you have waves coming in this neural network from one layer to the next here. I'm showing you a one hidden layer, but you could have multiple layers. Uh, and essentially, we are trying to learn the weights of these layers, and we want weights of most of these edges to be zero. Uh, and the idea is that the way this neural network is connected to the gene regulatory network is that if there is a path uh, based on the non-zero weights uh, from a transcription factor to a, a gene, uh, then that transcription factor is influencing that gene. So you would put an edge in the network. Okay, so for example, if you look at the G2, right, uh, here, there is a path from T1 uh, to uh, G2, right? So there is this edge from T1 to the second neuron in the hidden layer, and from there it goes to G2. Uh, and then there is a T2 also has a way to get to this third neuron in the hidden layer, and it gets to G2. So essentially, we are modeling G2 expression as a function of the expression of T1 and T2, the two transcription factors, and some noise epsilon and so forth, right? So you have to infer the weights of these all these uh, all these. Uh, 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 you know, uh, the pairwise weights between every every alternate layers and so forth. Uh, so essentially, you know, we try to jointly optimize uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the neural network weights connecting every gene to its transcription factor. We try to minimize the error uh, and we try to introduce the sp sparsity and so forth. And then we use alternate minimization as an iterative algorithm to do this. Uh, and then we use this unrolling algorithm uh, uh, to to try to get that sparsity and, and to be able to use the AM minimization and algorithms and so forth. So so this is uh, this is uh, so essentially you could use use uh, there's a lot of recent research on learning sparse graphical models right from data, um, not necessarily just gene networks, but we sort of uh, innovated and adapted those methods and then applied that to applied that to gene networks. But you could use this for uh, you know any sparse uh, network uh, construction using using deep learning and so forth. Uh, one last method, again using machine learning, that I want to briefly touch upon is this concept of an ensemble networks. So the idea of the ensemble networks came from a 2012 paper, again by Marbach et al. And the title, the paper is titled "Wisdom of the Crowds." So what they found is that so there are all these different mathematical approaches that try to predict the network from data, right? And they don't give identical results, right? So they all give different, different results. So the idea is that is there a way we can combine all of these results um, and come up with a better network, 
right? Mm -hmm. So essentially, you know, build your network using information theory, using deep learning, using Bayesian networks, using, uh, you know, CLR, using something else, right? Um, and, and then look at the networks generated by each method and could we somehow uh, learn from all of them to build what is called an ensemble network, a combination network that actually has superior quality. And they showed that doing something as simple as rank averaging gives you better results than any of the constituent networks. Okay, So the rank aver averaging is very simple. Every algorithm is going to predict uh, interaction between certain gene pairs. Right. So what you do is that many, many, many of these methods give you a strength of the interaction. So if it's mutual information, uh, the mutual information number, which is a number between zero and one, tells you the strength of the interaction and so forth. Right. So what you do is that you take the output of every method and say, please rank order your predictions. Right. You're predicting that there are edges between various pairs of genes. So what's your number one prediction? What are you most confident about? What is your number two? What is your number three? And so forth. So make a list of predictions for every method and rank averaging is basically average the rank of a particular prediction across all the methods right and then tally the results and just see you know if, if so if there is a prediction that is higher confidence by everybody that becomes the the higher entry in the rank averaging method and so forth so very simple unsupervised just averaging and say you know and they, they showed that even that works much better and there's a more recent study in 2019 by Bellor et al where they studied eight different ways of combining these things. And then they came up with uh, one method that they chose called scale L sum to give the best results among the eight that they've done. So the way scale L sum works is that if you are trying to, uh, rather than do the rank averaging and treat all edge weights as the same, because the interaction strengths can vary, but they could still be significant, uh, in order to compute the rank of a particular edge, right? you want to first normalize the edge weight by looking at the neighboring edges, right? So if there is an edge between two genes, GI and GJ, see all the edges GI is connected to, see all the edges GJ is connected to, look at all of their uh, weights, and then in relation to that weight, you normalize your own weight essentially. So you do that normalization and then you do the rank averaging and so forth. And they showed that that gives the best results. So all of the approaches to date are unsupervised and they don't incorporate any biological knowledge. So we thought, why don't we do uh, a, a thorough study where we could actually do supervised learning? And so how do you do supervised learning and so forth, right? So uh, this is where we will start to get into a plant biology. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to build whole genome networks of this plant, Arbidopsis thaliana, by mining publicly available uh, data and then build networks and so forth. So one of the things is that if you take all of the data and try to build the networks, the networks tend to be not as useful because the network is not a static thing. It depends on the condition. It depends on various tissues and so forth, right? So what we did was that uh, uh, there are 20,000 experiments that are used here and they were manually curated because there was no other way. Uh, so I'm glad I didn't do the work. Uh, and and there's manually curated into 20 different data sets. Uh, 11 data sets based on conditions and nine data sets based on tissues, right? So the, what the experiments were done on the root of the plant or the, or the leaf of the plant or what, what was it done on? Was it done in the development stage or did you give it salt water or did you give it abiotic stress and all kinds of things, right? Uh, and, and so forth. So, so then these experiments were essentially capturing a similar set of conditions and therefore you build these gene networks for every one of those conditions. So uh, the first thing we did was we took all possible gene uh, uh, network construction methods. So we evaluated about 15 of them. And then we evaluated how good they are using synthetic data and so forth. And then we saw which one of them can be applied at scale, at the whole genome scale. So all of the methods that we, some of the methods we developed, not the deep learning one, but the mutual information Bayesian theory can be done at large scale. Some of the methods others developed could be at large scale. So there are only six methods at the end that could be applied at the large scale. So we use them all to construct these different networks. And then we combine the networks into ensemble networks. And then we used it to do biological validation and so forth. And we, again, here injected the idea of supervised learning. So how do you do supervised learning on, uh, on, on, this, uh, on this data? So to do supervised learning, you need positive examples and negative examples. So we got positive examples from mining the literature, right? So people write papers saying that, hey, we found this gene is interacting with that could be a paper and so forth, right? So there is already a work by 
biology professor at Stanford who built what is called the Narabit transcriptional research uh, net, uh, uh, transcriptional uh, network, ATRM, that has data mining from the literature of all the documented interactions. The tricky part was to come up with negative training examples. They don't exist at all. So the trick that we have done is that uh, we know that after the genes are expressed and they become proteins, they go into different compartments of the cell and they do different functions. So if the proteins are expressed in different compartments of the cell, they are nowhere near each other to interact. So we use that essentially to uh, create uh, uh, negative examples because, uh, and, and, and that, that was used for, for, for training. Um, and then you could again use a machine learning model basically, right? So uh, I have uh, edge predictions from different methods. And then how do you aggregate them? And you can aggregate them using a function. And here we are trying to minimize the least square error here. Uh, and then again, our framework is general that for F you could use any function. Uh, so we use logistic regression, random forest, uh, neural networks, SVM, anything under the sun. And we found that the results were the best with XGBoost. So then we did all our experiments with that. So uh, I, I, let me take a couple of minutes uh, to show you what we can do with this. So I'm showing you the Arabidopsis whole genome network. It has, uh, you know, uh, the network itself has only about 15,000 genes, even though we started with 22,500, because the gene expression measurements didn't reveal enough about the other genes. So we could not meaningfully include them in the network. So they got dropped out in the statistical normalization process and other processes along the algorithm. And I'm only showing you top 5% of the genes based on how uh, robustly they're connected, how densely they're connected. And the size of each node here gives you the degree of that node in the final network. And Density of the color tells you the betweenness centrality of that node. And so you could actually make a catalog of uh, uh, nodes with high betweenness centrality, and they are all in this case involved in photosynthesis. So you can appreciate that because you know photosynthesis is the way a plant lives, right? That's how it gets uh, converts uh, you know energy from the sun into uh, all the things that it needs for life. So all the important genes happen to be there. Those are the critical genes for the plant. Okay, now how do you make use of this network? So what we do is that, let's say that a biologist is interested in studying a partially characterized pathway. What it means is that they have some understanding of the genes involved in a pathway, but they don't know every gene. And we want to make predictions and help them, right? So on the right side of this diagram, you are seeing a biologically known pathway. In this case, I'm showing you a pathway uh, that uh, is called a carotenoid pathway. It's a pathway that is responsible for the vitamin content in the plants, the color and texture and things like that. So this is what a biological pathway looks like. So it shows different chemicals and different proteins convert from one to the other and so forth. So this is an incomplete pathway. So they know some genes that work in the pathway. So what we have done is that we take the set of known genes, which are shown in, in the red, red or pink color, depending on how you see it on this diagram to the left. Um, and we essentially take these uh, known genes as seed genes in the whole genome network and say, if these genes are important to a pathway, looking at the topology of the whole genome network, the graph, what other genes could be important? So for that, we essentially borrowed from page rank algorithm where we rank every other gene with respect to the set of these seed genes using a standard page rank style algorithm. So now we have ranking of all the genes with respect to the seed genes. So we rank order them in decreasing order of the rank um, and then say, okay, let's take our top, top, top ranked one and put that in the network. Next ranked one, put that in the network and so forth. And we see if the remaining network is connected. So we keep adding these until we get a connected network and we end up with a network like this. Then essentially we say, okay, we have seed genes and using seed genes, we extracted this subnetwork. So let us study the other genes in the subnetwork. So there are uh, databases that tell you the functions of genes. So the blue ones here are genes for which we already know the function. So we eliminate those. Uh, and the green ones are those that work in associated pathways. So genes that work in associated pathways will also be correlated. So we remove them from consideration. Then we end up with the yellow ones. The yellow ones are the ones with no known function. So then we go to the biologist and say, my algorithm is predicting these, these yellow genes have a play a role in the carotenoid pathway. So how do they, then they can go ahead and do experiments to verify it. In case of plants, doing these experiments is very easy. So that you can, there is an Arabidopsis bank, right? There's, a, there's this, uh, you can call them and you can say, please knock out this gene and send me the seed, right? So they can essentially introduce mutations in a gene and destroy the activity of the gene and send you a seed. And then you plant that seed and then the plant grows. 
And so now you can grind the tissue from the plant and do a gene expression measurement experiment and see what is the effect of um, you know, disabling that gene basically. Right. So I want to show you two successful experiments. Obviously, not every experiment is successful. Only one in three or one in four is our success rate. So I'm highlighting, you know, two of these big yellow blobs. So yeah, we, you know, ordered the seeds from the uh, from the from the bank, um, and essentially you get the wild type Arabidopsis, which is the healthy Arabidopsis. And we knocked out one gene here. This is the label of the gene, and we knocked out another gene here, and we plant them. And after a few weeks, you see that the wild type plant is big and then the other two plants are uh, a little smaller, right? So basically the carotenoid pathway is also involved in the development and the growth of the plant. So the, there is tinted growth because you knocked out those genes. So you can see a visual proof that this is working. Now what you do is that you grind the tissue from these plants and do a gene expression measurement experiment. So what I'm showing here is that there are three bars for every column. So on the x-axis, what you're seeing is the uh, genes that are known to be in the carotenoid pathway. So biologists know that these genes play a role uh, in the pathway. So we are trying to see if I knock, if it's wild type uh, versus if I knock out this new gene that I predicted versus if I knock out this new gene that I predicted, how is the expression of the known genes in the carotenoid pathway being affected? Right. So as you can see, uh, in, in the case of PSY, right, there is no relation, right? So all three bars are about the same height. So if you knock out the other two genes, the expression of PSY is not affected. But in the case of this, for example, here, NPQ1, right, if I knock out the first gene, then the expression of NP, NPQ1 really went up, right? Whereas the other one didn't change, right? So essentially, using information like this, you can actually position the prediction in this pathway. Because as you can see, this pathway has a bifurcation, right? So if something interacts here, it will have an effect on everything downstream. If something is in one of these branches, it will only affect the things downstream in that branch and so forth. So by observing what is affected, then I could actually position this in the pathway and I can actually learn uh, the pathway and so forth. So we use this, uh, these, these machine learning approaches uh, in order to study Arabidopsis through a bunch of grants with the biology division at NSF and our collaborators. So we studied the carotenoid pathway, we studied another pathway called brassinosteroid pathway, uh, and then we have a bunch of papers in biological journals that are coming uh, out of these, uh, these networks. Okay, uh, so I used up my, my hour, maybe I took a few minutes extra, uh, apologies for that. Uh, let me let me stop here uh, and, and and take uh, any 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 questions. Uh, the the figure that you're seeing there is actually the uh, the data science uh, and engineering research institute at Georgia Tech, of which I'm the director. Um, as as Jan mentioned, it's a it's a nice uh, beautiful 21 story building that we moved into in 2019, uh, just uh, less than a year before COVID hit. Uh, but we are basically trying to build a ecosystem in data science, machine learning, and AI, and everything by co-locating researchers who work in different departments at Georgia Tech, uh, who work on similar problems and similar areas into this building so that there is more continued interaction. And we also share this building 50-50 with industry um, so that we have data science industry co-located uh, with us. So uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, welcome you to visit us and if you happen to come to the area or if you want to make a visit just uh, let me know and then you know we can work something out so thank you Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, okay, hearing some echoes, but yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure people in the uh, Zoom call can also hear my question. I'm very impressed. Uh, the uh, you're scaling all of the network. Uh, construction algorithm and a very, very large scale. So I have two questions. One is uh, really, uh, it's very impressive to show the um, the result in the Arabidopsis network construction through the lab experiment. 
I wonder if you have thought about more systematically evaluating these prediction results because uh, some of the, you can say quote unquote complaint from biologists is that we generate way too many things. They only have limited effort and sometimes they're lucky they can validate it. But a lot of time there could be false positive prediction yeah, sure. and then that really damaged the reputation of computer scientists. We have to really give them maybe a limited number of predictions and tell them that we have overall very good uh, hit rate for them to go out. I wonder if you have some thoughts on that. And the second is uh, about the network uh, that you construct. And I wonder um, the stratification of the network groups is based on very coarse, you know, typical groups like uh, condition and so on. When you look at the metadata, there could be very fine differences. Uh, every uh, Arabidopsis, even though they're the same species and they could be different due to, to genetic variations and so on and so forth. So there could be very unique network in every, uh, experiment and there may not be universal network so how do you actually use maybe some probabilistic inference to indicate well this is the major backbone that's universal and then these are subsets that is sample specific thank you yeah, so both, both uh, two excellent questions so the first question is about how do you uh biologists into using uh, these methods because we often make loss predictions and so forth, right? So it's actually a difficult challenge that requires some, uh, uh, I don't know how to cut my phone. Uh, or, or is it coming from there? Oh yeah, let me mute. Okay, oh good, this is, this is better. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Uh, so the, the main thing is that this requires trusted teams of computer scientists and biologists working together. Because what I noticed is that there is a fundamental philosophical difference here, where we say that, you know, let's do the computational analysis, data mining, and come up with predictions, and then you go do the testing. And sometimes uh, doesn't go well with the biologists because they like it the other way. They think about things, they design the experiments, and you come in and analyze the data from their experiments. But if you do these predictions, you're telling them what experiments they do. Uh, and if it is wrongly interpreted, it could also look like we are telling them to do what 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 uh, what to target and what experiments to do and so forth. So this requires a level of trust. So I haven't succeeded in um, you know unknown biology investigators using these techniques. Uh, there is part of the reason could be the trust, but part of the reason also is that in order to actually make these predictions, right? They can't just ask a student in their group to just go ahead and. Uh, you know, make these predictions by running our software because they don't know enough actually. So this so far I have only succeeded in actual collaborations, right? Um, so we've done a bunch of collaborations and, uh, you know, when we started off this work, actually, I started off this work by working with my wife, who is a molecular biologist who actually came to us with this question. And so that kind of, this whole research was led by that question and she was studying the carotenoid pathway. So the experiments that I've shown are done by her. So it was a little easier for me to kind of get started that way. But had other biology collaborators, in particular, Jan Hayen at Iowa State and Patrick Schnabel at Iowa State and Trevor Nolan at Duke and so forth, who were willing to work with us in the study of different pathways and write grants with us actually to NSF to say, we want to study this pathway and we want to use these tools and so forth and integrate the two, 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 two approaches. So I'm kind of making a dent that way. The main selling point that I try to make is that, okay, in the absence of using these tools, what is your false positive rate? And am I improving on that, right? So I'm not going to tell you, so my success rate is 25%. And if your success rate is 10%, then I save you money, right? So that's essentially the argument that I try to make. Uh, the other thing that we've done, which I didn't have time to show, is that there is a way we actually use the experiments done in a lab together with uh, experiments done in public databases, but give priority to the experiments that are done in the lab to come up with the networks uh, in, in a way that would kind of appease to them saying that, you know, 
you are actually tapping into the other data, but we are giving your data priority essentially. So things like that can be can be done. Um, I think the second question that you asked, if I remember correctly, is that uh, you know Arabidopsis is not a single plant, and just like humans, you know there is individual genetic variations, and then the networks are different in every condition. And how do you how do you deal with that? So as you as I as I mentioned in the beginning, right, the the broader you capture the data the less specific the network is and, and the less reliable your answers are. So it's really the data preparation, other things that are key. So one thing is that all the mathematical methods we came up would be an advancement in the algorithms and machine learning and other areas in high performance computing. They would work, they would work even beyond biology. So if you want to build a Bayesian network for medical diagnostic or a Bayesian network for whatever, right? Predicting something else, it doesn't matter really, it could be very, you know, anything, right? Uh, the algorithms would kind of work but then the application of those algorithms. So for example, we, we found that it really takes tremendous effort to actually tune this to work for biology. So just scoring function, for example, we had to spend a year playing with many scoring functions to try to get somewhere. So the algorithm will be there. It just gives you horrible results. You don't know if it works or not, but then if you change the scoring function, it'll be different uh, and, and so forth. And also how to curate the data, the, feed the, the data that you feed into it and so forth. Um, so a lot of painstaking effort will have to go in. We're seeing some initial success, but it's nowhere near where, you know, biologists are universally converted or anything like that. So. Yeah, so that's that's an excellent question. So for the benefit of the online participants, let me just repeat the question, um, is that there are a lot of nuances that go in between a gene getting translated to a protein. And so there are a lot, what I earlier referred to as post-transcriptional modifications and so forth. So the question is, how do we take into account? Uh, the answer is, unfortunately, we don't. So these are all uh, basically transcriptional networks at the transcription level. So we're only looking at that. So a lot happens after the mRNA is, is generated about the decay, degradation, uh, you know, other enhancements, modifications, and so forth. And to capture that, you really need to look at the protein-protein interaction networks and go there. So this research is not that. So absolutely, so there is there is a limitation. Okay. Any any other questions? Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone.